Good morning, people. Uh, this uh, video, uh, this uh, sermon will be posted on December 6th at Sunday morning. We are still in our um, online virtual services. Uh, looking forward to the day when we will be meeting back again. We don't know how long this will go, I'm sure, into uh, January or so, but we will see how how this coronavirus uh, goes on. I hope that you had a good week. We had a good week this week, and the Lord continues to bless us. Uh, so let's get into our sermon for the day. We are continuing on in the book of Judges. I just have three messages left in the book of Judges, and then we're going to pick up the book of Ruth, and I have, what, seven messages in the book of Ruth. All right, today's message, last week we covered two chapters, chapter 17 and 18. Strange story about um, the Levite and the moving of Dan. Dan. He set up his own priesthood with a, with, a, with a Levite. Micah set up his own priesthood with a Levite. And then Dan came along and stole them, and Dan moved their tribe from the south of Israel to the north of Israel. Well, we're going to look at a start of another strange story. Uh, I've entitled this message, The Sins of Gibeah. We're going to look at one of the cities of the tribe of Benjamin. And then that's going to go on in the next two sermons, dealing with Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin almost wiped out. But today we're going to look at Judges chapter 19. All right, today's humor. I always, as you know, start my sermon off with a humorous and sometimes a not so humorous story. But here's today. A man in court says, Judge, 60% of my parking tickets are bogus. The judge says to him, repeat infractions the man says fine three-fifths of my tickets are bogus <laughs> the judge was saying repeat are these repeat infractions and he thought he wanted them to repeat it infractions all right let's go on Here's my outline for uh, this chapter, breaking this chapter up. Really a strange story. There's going to be a really surprise, weird ending in the end of this chapter. And uh, we'll pick up on that again next week, Lord willing, and find out why he did what he did. But so a Levite and his concubine, starting chapter 19, verses 1, 2, and 3. Second point in my outline. Uh, the concubine went home, went back home, and her father, this Levite's father-in-law, delays him. Um, he finally does leave, verses 4 through 11. Chapter 3, as he's traveling home, he goes to the city of Gibeah, and there's an old man there who shows him hospitality kind of quickly. We don't want you staying in the city square. Well, why? Well, we'll see in just a minute. But verses 12 through 21, um, point number four, Gibeah, this is the whole city, Gibeah's crime. What a horrible, horrible crime it was. Verses 22 through 26. Um, point number five, the gory reaction of the Levite, verses 27 through 30. So only five points in my message today. Um, and we have 30 verses. I don't think I have listed quite all of the verses in, my, in the text of my uh, PowerPoint here, but I listed the ones that are relevant uh, to the following of the story. All right, so point number one, a Levite and his concubine, verses 1 through 11. Now, a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, so he got a wife. I say a wife. He got a concubine. But she was unfaithful to him. She left him and went back to her parents' home in Bethlehem, Judah. 
after she had been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him a servant and two donkeys. She took him into her parents' home, and when the father-in-law saw him, gladly welcomed him. All right, so some comments. This Levite had a wife, and I say a wife. Um, very clearly, the text says a concubine, a lesser wife. We're going to look in the next slide or so about what a concubine was. And this uh, concubine was unfaithful uh, to her husband and had uh, relations with another man. And so I'm sure caused all kinds of problems in the household. Uh, she left him and went back home. Remember this Levite lives up way up in uh, the hill country of Ephraim. She was from Bethlehem and she traveled and went back home. After four months went by, he wanted her back. So he traveled down to Bethlehem to try to reconcile the marriage again. Uh, Bethlehem will play a great part in the book of Ruth during this time. All right? So uh, we have seen Bethlehem before in the book of Judges. Um, and now we see Bethlehem here again. This concubine was from the city of Bethlehem. So this Levite travels up to Bethlehem to get her back. When he got there, the father-in-law was very hospitable and took him in. Okay, so there's point number one. All right. Let's talk about concubines. Very clearly, it says she was a concubine. I got this from uh, BibleStudyTools.com. I find a very good um, site for sermon preparation, very good uh, comments on there. Here's what they have said. A female slave who functions as a secondary wife and surrogate mother. So uh, there, there's a concubine. They've had a practice they, in, the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament particularly. Um, they would have their full-fledged wives, but then they would also take on um, slave women who would become a, a secondary wife, not looked at as a full-fledged wife, but would be like a wife to the husband. You remember when Jacob wanted to marry Rachel and he got Leah and then got Rachel, the two handmaidens came along um, with them. They were concubines. So the 12 children, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob came from all four of uh, the wives, the two full-fledged wives, Leah and Rachel, and then the two concubines as well. So it was a practice in the Bible to have kind of a secondary wife, a slave wife. While concubines did not have the same status as wives, they were not to be mistreated. That was in the law in Exodus chapter 21. Nor could they be violated by other males. So here this, this concubine had um, unfaithful to her husband, violated Genesis 35, 22. They seem to have received higher status if they bore sons. Uh, they became a little more important if the child that they would have was a son because the son would become an heir, a full-fledged heir, if from a concubine. The practice of taking concubines as wives was used to provide a male heir for a barren wife. So the, the main wife that a, a fellow might take might not have any sons and they needed an heir. So just as in the case of, of uh, Jacob, um, a concubine may produce a male child who the inheritance could go to. In addition to the practice, uh, in, addi <clears throat> in addition, the practice provided a social safety net for the family who could could sell their daughter uh, in dire times. So you could get some daughters to sell, uh, maybe to become a concubine to somebody else as they grew up. So concubines, huh? here's, here's a reference. Uh, this is an interesting reference. Solomon, uh, his wives were a downfall to him. His wives influenced him. Many, Solomon married many, many, we're gonna see in this verse, many, many women. 
Um, many times they were princesses. They were the daughters of kings of other nations around them. And this was a common practice. And even though Israel was not supposed to do it, Solomon practiced it. Um, but not only did he have wives, he had concubines. Look at these verses. Now, Solomon, King, now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. So the Lord had commanded that they shouldn't do that. We've, we saw the problem with this in the book of Judges. Throughout the book of Judges, many, many times it was them intermarrying with the Gentiles around them that caused them to leave the Lord and worship the idols of the, their wives. And this happened to Solomon as well. Solomon built temples to, and in his older age, he seems to have abandoned the Lord. But notice this next verse. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Uh, so, so we find, I show you this verse simply to say, um, well, to show you the warning. The Lord had commanded them not to uh, intermarry with the Gentiles around them, and Solomon disregarded this because it was a common practice of the day to intermarry with um, the king's daughters of other nations to form peace treaties and things of that nature. But can you imagine? He had 700 wives, and then he had 300 slave wives as well. All right, so he goes up to Bethlehem. As he tries to woo his concubine wife back to come back with him, the father-in-law delays, verses 4 through 11. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. Okay, dot, dot, dot. I've skipped a few verses. Well, so it's part of that verse. And on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning, and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that, you may go. She, he is trying to delay him again. And when the man, verse 9, so I jumped, a, I jumped down a few verses, because this happened several times. He kept uh, delaying, delaying, and delaying. Uh, it happened, I think, three times in our text. And when the man and his concubine and his servants rose up to depart, the father-in-law, the girl's father said to him, please spend the night. He, he wanted them to delay again. And this, is, this time the man says, the man would not spend the night. No, I've delayed already a bunch of days. I need to get back. I'm not going to do it again. Let me go. Okay, so I got some comments here. I have skipped a few verses in here, obviously, but the father-in-law kept asking him to stay instead of taking his daughter away from him. He was glad his daughter had come home. He had missed his daughter. He loved his daughter. Even though she was a concubine, even though she had been unfaithful to her husband, she came back home to daddy, and daddy took her in. Now the husband comes to take her away, and he tries everything he can to delay and to keep her there. The Levite accepted several times, but finally he said he had to go. And he had to put his foot down and say, no. So he left with his concubine and they headed back home. Okay, so it's quite a trip from uh, Bethlehem up to Ephraim. We'll see in the next chapter, in the next part of this chapter, they had to stop overnight. <coughs> a lesson I think we can learn out of this. Sometimes we as believers need to learn to say no to others who keep imposing on us. We need to be kind. We need to be willing to do things. But sometimes it just gets to be too much and for the sake of other priorities and other things in our life, sometimes we need to say no. This guy said Father-in-law, I'm glad that you are showing hospitality to me, but I have 
to go. Sometimes we have to say no and get on doing the things that we're supposed to be doing. All right, <clears throat> point number three, the hospitality of the old man, chapter 19, verses 12 through 21. <clears throat> so I start here with verse 14. So they went on and the sun set as they neared Gibeah in Benjamin. So they're traveling. Uh, they're coming through where the tribe of Benjamin was at. And one of the major cities of Benjamin was Gibeah. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. So it, it was common practice. Travelers would come to a town and they would go to the city square and then the people of the town, it was kind of their obligation. I got a slide talking about hospitality in the Old Testament coming up here, but it was their obligation to make sure that these travelers were taken care of. So there they sat and sat and sat and no one took them in for the night. That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim who was living in Gibeah. So here a guy uh, who was from his own his own uh, tribe, hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gibeah. The inhabitants of the place were Benjamites. So this was, that comes in play in, kind of important in the next chapter is in that the whole tribe backs the sins of Gibeah. Anyway, this old man came in from the work in the fields you are welcome at my house, the old man said. I will supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. Now, that's an interesting statement. Um, don't Only don't spend the night in the square. He, he could be saying, well, we need to show you hospitality because that's important. But it seems, as we'll see in the next section, that there was another reason, a more urgent reason. Oh, no, we don't want you spending the night in the square because it's dangerous out here. Quickly come to my house, kind of, is what he is saying. So I got some comments here. The Levite and the concubine came to the town of Gibeah. As was the practice for visitors, they waited at the town square for someone to show them hospitality and invite them to their home. Okay, that was the practice, uh, very common in those days. We don't we don't see this anymore. Of course, we're in a day and age where there's hotels all over the place and rest areas and different stuff like that, but. Uh, and back in the Old Testament, they would come in, they would go to the town square, the city square, and wait for somebody to show them hospitality. The old man did this for them. He invited them to spend the night at his home. He was concerned that they did not spend too much time at the town square. He was concerned about that. Well, why was he concerned about that? We'll see that in a couple of verses here. Hospitality in the old in the in the Hebrew Bible. This is from an article by Peter Altman I found online. People away from home need protection, shelter, and food. They are at the mercy of the, the local people. Huh? In response, the Hebrew Bible makes a central value of hospitality care for such outsiders. Okay, it was important to show hospitality. In the New Testament, the word uh, translated as showing hospitality is literally translated from a word, two words put together, meaning love of strangers. Uh, we are to show hospitality. So here, uh, it, was a, it was a very important thing in the Old Testament. Israelites are often reminded that they too were aliens in Egypt. And they traveled to a strange land. Um, Leviticus 19.34 is an example of that. So they should care for strangers that come into their towns. The law in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 and 29, of the third year tithe shows that food for foreigners became an important uh, legal statute. 
uncommon in the ancient Near Eastern law. So in the Deuteronomy chapter 14, it mentions there was one of the tithes. By the way, the Israelites did not just tithe once, they tithed a number of times. So here was a tithe that would go to feed foreigners, help the foreigners in their land. That tithe would come into the to the priests, the Levites, and then the Levites would distribute that to help uh, foreigners who were living in their land. Isn't that interesting? Built right into the law that they were to give to show hospitality towards others. Here's a cross-reference. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Paul, Peter says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. There's a command, since love covers a multitude of sins. But then in verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, maybe it's a little different in our day and age. We don't have a city square that foreigners will come to, and we can show them hospitality by taking them home, but we certainly have ways of showing hospitality, not only to strangers, but here Peter says, to one another. The people of our local church, the Christians that we know, the people of our Christian community, we are as believers to show hospitality, sharing of our goods with them. The Lord has blessed us. We need to be able to use that to bless others. All right, point number four. I'm working my way through this. Gibeah's crime, verses 22 through 26. Okay, so the Levite and his wife are staying in this town of Gibeah, and the old man has quickly got them out of the town square and says, no, come to my house. And so they're spending the night at the old man's house. Now look what happens. While they were enjoying themselves, Okay, so they were having a good time. They had supper together and they were laughing. And this guy was from Ephraim as well. And they were having fellowship. Some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house. Pounding on the door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so that we can have sex with him. Wow. Uh, verse 22 wicked men from the city. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. So uh, I know I skipped verse 23, but the old man is willing to give his own daughter to them so that they won't do such a wicked thing. And this guy is willing to give up, this Levite is willing to give up his concubine. So the men took his concubine. Okay, so these wicked men that wanted to have homosexual relations with uh, the Levite, uh, they took the concubine and sent her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night, and at the dawn, they let her go. So the whole night, uh, they raped her, they abused her. What a horrible thing went on in this city of Gibeah. At daybreak, the woman went back to the house where the master was staying, fell down at the door, and lay there until daylight. Okay, so all night this went on. What a horrible, horrible sin. Uh, I, here's my comments. I say, wow, sounds just like the sin of Sodom when Lot was visited by angels. Doesn't this story sound a lot like that? But this is a city in Israel. This isn't a... Um, Gentile town. This is a people who knows the Lord. They have the law of the Lord, and these people of Gibeah have abandoned the Lord and get into this horrible types of sin, the same kind of sin that Sodom had gotten into. These, dead, these men did take the man's concubine and raped her throughout the night. That word is used right in the text, raped her throughout the night. By morning, she wandered back to the home where her husband was staying. What a horrible sin the men of the city had committed. We see homosexuality and other horrible sexual sins going on uh, in the, this city. 
I, it sounds similar to, to the story of Sodom. Here I go back to the Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. But but before you lay down, the men of the but before they lay down, these were the angels coming to visit Lot, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all of the people of the last to the last man surrounded the house. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And of course, this is knowing them biblically. Huh? Um, Adam knew his wife and she conceived, the Bible says, well, here, that we may have sexual relations with them. Lot went out to the men in the entrance and shut the door after him. Okay, so... Uh, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. So just as Lot was willing to get up, give up his daughters, this elderly man from Ephraim was willing to give his virgin daughter, and the man was willing to give his concubine. So I... I know she dies here. We're going to see that in this next thing. But can you think about this this concubine? First of all, she wasn't a full-fledged wife. Her husband looked down on her. Secondly, she had had been unfaithful to him and went back home at a broken home. He's trying to put it back together, but taking her back as a concubine. And then he's willing to give her up so that other men can can have sexual relations with her, rape her against her will. What a what a situation, what a mistreating of this lady. Here's a cross reference. Uh going back to the sins of Gibeah, the sins in that wicked city. It says, Or do you not know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice, uh, and uh, of course this relates to our story, the sexually immoral and men who practice homosexuality they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, God can reach down and save people, but when he saves them, he works at changing their lives and getting them out of the sin that they may be involved in and radically changing them and making them a new creation. The such were some of you, Corinthians but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So they had been involved in these things, all of these things, drunkards, greedy, they were thieves, they were homosexuals, they were sexually immoral. And then the gospel came to Corinth and some believed and their lives were changed and transformed because they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, point number five, my last point, the gory reaction of the Levites, verses 27 through 30. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. Isn't it interesting? To continue on his way, he was going to leave with his servant and his two donkeys and go back home. He thought the concubine was, was gone. But there was her body. Um, she had died. Uh, her, her hands were laying on the threshold. When he reached home, so he it doesn't tell us anymore. Well, I, I skipped verse 28. He picked her up, put her on her do, do, donkey, and they went home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Whoa! Of course, she's dead already. So he took the body, took another day to get home to Ephraim, took the body, 
uh, off the donkey and cut it up into 12 parts and then through messengers sent these pieces of the body to around probably the major towns of the 12 tribes of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done, nor since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Just imagine, we must do something. So speak up. So they, they got all up in arms about such a thing. All right, comments I've made here. When the Levite got up in the morning, he found her dead on the doorpost. He simply took her home. He did not kill her. She was already dead, but he does a horrible thing. He cuts her body up into 12 pieces and sends them to the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah, kind of leaving us hanging here. We will see next week why he did this. It's very clearly explained uh, in the next chapter as we get into there. But it certainly caused the rest of Israel to get up in arms. We need to do something about such a horrible thing, they said. It caused a great reaction which is what he wanted to happen. So we'll talk about that next week. Okay, conclusion of my message today. This story shows the wickedness of the day. Uh, that's what I had mentioned. These last stories uh, in the book of Judges, we're not talking about judges per se anymore, but these are two stories that are left, in, that are at the end of the book of Judges. Um strange stories. Uh, this one's a weird one, uh, but there's a show the wickedness of what's going on. Here, a city in Israel, Gibeah of the tribe of Benjamin, is as wicked as Sodom. You remember what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah? Hail, uh, hailstones and fire came out of heaven and consumed them and uh, here is a city that is just as wicked as the city of Sodom going on right in Israel. They all knew the Lord and his word, but had abandoned it. Wow. You know, we have the God's word in the Bible and we neglect it and we abandon it and we don't obey everything that it tells us to do. We as believers in the Lord Jesus who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we need to be careful, we need to know the word of God, and we need to follow it. We need to abandon sin in our lives, not abandon God's word. Every man, ah, here we are, is that verse? That was uh, the theme of the book of Judges. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Levites were considered spiritual men, so any false religion could be de developed using them. We saw that in the story last week. The Levites, uh, they hired that, uh, Micah hired that Levite to be his spiritual leader. Uh, here again, uh, Le the Levites were spiritual men. They, they felt they could develop whatever religion they wanted. Dan had received its inheritance from the Lord. Okay, this was from the last, the message, message. Um, and then the action similar, yeah, did, Dan had received its inheritance from the Lord, but they were dissatisfied with it and wanted it to steal a different area. That was last week's message. And now in this week's message, and then the action similar to Sodom and Gomorrah in this Israelite city. Well, the story is going to go on for two more chapters. I have two more messages after this going through the last two chapters of the book of Judges. But it, it sure tells us. I see two applications here out of this. We need to treat people with respect. I think about how this concubine was treated and mistreated. We need to, in our relations with other people, certainly need to treat people with respect. Secondly, we need to be careful to obey the Word of God. Read and study the Word of God every day and then obey what it says. James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. All right, let's conclude in a word of prayer.
Father, thank you for this message, this story. What a horrible, strange story, but you have included it in your word so that we can see the horribleness of sin. Father, I pray that we may apply this message to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People, thank you. I will be posting this on Sunday morning uh, for you to listen to.